It's our great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Tobias Capwell. Tobias is Curator of Arms and Armour at the Wallace Collection in London, um, and he is also a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and an internationally renowned expert on arms and armour, and medi particularly medieval and Renaissance weapons. He is the author of many books. I'm going to read because I can't remember all their names. Arms and Armour of the Medieval Joust, which he published in 2018. Armour of the English Knight. Masterpieces of European Arms and Armour at the Wallace Collection, which was the Apollo Book of the Year, uh, 2012. And Toby also regularly appears on television and YouTube videos, which are rather mm. wonderful. We love them. <laughs> <laughs> um, most recently, he appeared in A Stitch in Time, which was on BBC, uh, Richard III, New Evidence. And he was also the writer and presenter of Metalworks, The Knight's Tale, all on the BBC. So, um, Tonight, I'm particularly uh, happy to, to welcome Toby to talk about the current exhibition at the Wallace Collection on Henry Moore's um, metal heads, uh, helmet heads, rather. Um, and I'm, um, I'm very interested in this because one of the things that we're trying to do at the Colnaghi Foundation is to, um, is to get more people interested in pre-20th century art. And we're particularly interested in the uh, in the relationships between contemporary and 20th century artists and pre-20th century art and how there's an ongoing conversation um, between the two. And so, you know, this subject of Henry Moore looking at these ancient objects, um, and Tobias will tell us that they are work, that we should see this armour as, as, as a series of works of art, um, is, is, is going to be very interesting. So, Tobias, will you tell us a little bit about the exhibition? And yeah, the yeah, I, um, I thought... I thought it'd be a good idea just to race through a, a couple of slides to give you, if you haven't seen the exhibition, just a flavor of, of what's in it and the themes and the content. Uh, and then, you know, whatever we have to say about it might, might make a, a little bit more uh, sense. So um, the, um, the show that's on now at the Wallace runs through the 23rd of June. And um, it's really a show that's been in gestation for about 20 years. And it originates really with uh, the head of collections at the Wallace Collection, uh, Jeremy Warren, uh, uh, um, a former head of collections and uh, also a sculpture specialist, and David Mitchinson, who was one of Henry Moore's assistants for many years and who later was the, the head of exhibitions at the foundation. So there is really a, a close kind of personal pedigree back to Moore himself. Um, which is really, uh, which is really great because the the, the show is uh, about Moore's work in the Wallace and how he was inspired specifically by the armor collection, um, and he came to the Wallace many times, but he always thought of it specifically as his armor place. Whenever he was thinking about armor and this kind of steel sculpture, the Wallace is the place that he went to study it, and he himself said that he. He spent many hours there. So it's a show that really could only be done at the Wallace. Uh, and you know, it's, it's also a, a part of Moore's story that isn't well known for, for reasons that we, you know, we might be able to talk about. And, and when, you know, I'm a, I'm a late medieval and Renaissance specialist. I could never have dreamed that I would have anything useful to say about 20th century sculpture. Um, and it was you know, very much a, a journey of discovery for me. And one of the first things I noticed when I started working seriously on it about 10 years ago and, and full time for the last 18 months or so, um, was that Moore's, you know, the story of Moore's time at the Wallace only dates from the 1920s when he can be considered a, a full time artist. But really, the, the, the things in his life that prepared him to be sensitive and open to the, the attributes of armor are much earlier. And in fact, they date right back to his early childhood with his first experience of sculpture. When he looked at the medieval church, he went to the medieval church at Methley in West Yorkshire, and he himself says that was his first experience of sculpture. And it was also his first experience of the images of men in armor because there are a number of very important funerary monuments um, to, to knights in that church. Um, he fought, of course, in the First World War uh, as a machine gunner at the Battle of Cambrai, one of the worst uh, periods of the war. 
Um, uh, four out of five men in his, in his brigade were killed, and those that weren't killed were mostly injured, including Moore himself. Um, and that's the background before he becomes an artist, and so he's, he's well prepared um, to, be, to be aware of this kind of imagery and, and where it can go. So almost from the moment he first arrived in London to go to the Royal College of Art, he was in the Wallace Collection. The evidence of his presence is there as early as 1923. Uh, at the same time, of course, he's going to the V&A, he's going to the British Museum, uh, he's going to the Science Museum, um, he's hoovering up all these extraordinary resources and making absolute, as a student, full use of them. Um, and he's trying to find his voice and his themes as an artist. He's trying to define himself. And, and w one of the reasons why I think he's really appropriate for everything the, the Foundation is trying to do now is um, that unlike a lot of modernists, he really was deeply involved with the past as well as he was trying to create really new and revolutionary ideas for art. Uh, a lot of modernists just discarded the past. They wanted to make a really firm break with the ornamental style of historical sculpture. They just didn't want to know about it and wanted to start from scratch. Brancusi is a perfect example of that and someone who's very influential uh, on Moore. Uh, but Moore was different. He looked at pre-Columbian sculpture. He looked at North African sculpture. He loved Michelangelo and Dura. Um, and uh, he, he's an artist who transcends time, really. Time doesn't apply to him. Uh, periods of fashion and style he's not interested in. He communes with artists wherever they are in time and space. And that's I think why he was able to create something really revolutionary and, and you can see very clearly how his interest in armor as a conceptual theme develops and all the way through the 1920s and 30s he's often in the Wallace developing his armor idea as one of the real foundation concepts of everything that defines him as an artist. Um, and it's, it's amazing that his, all of his investigation of armor really synthesizes into a, a, a really powerful abstract idea, the, what would later be called the helmet head idea, right on the eve of the Second World War, and then he has to stop, and he can't, he has to just put it down. He can't cast metal sculpture. All of his, assist, his assistants have gone off to military service. His studio gets bombed in the Blitz, and Kenneth Clark recruits him as a war artist, and he has to go off and do other things. So it wasn't just when he discovered the, the, the core idea, it is not the moment for that idea. And we have to then wait until 1950, when he's in a position to pick the idea up again, and that's where the, the helmet head numbered series begins. The, the helmet head series is the kind of core of the exhibition at the Wallace, and um, of, the, of, the, of the many good reasons why you should come to see the show, one, if you're interested in more and, and, and 20th century sculpture, this is the only chance to see all of the helmet head sculptures together. It's the only time they've been together. Moore never saw them this way. His family had never seen them this way. His daughter really uh, was really taken aback by it and had some, some nice things to say about that. Um, and, um, uh, and there they are, the numbered heads, number one through seven. Extraordinary thing that is, even though 1950, Moore has already been a working artist for a generation, um, now, the helmet heads span the entire remainder of his career. So, armor, as one of his core sources of inspiration, begins when he's nine, year old, nine years old, and he casts his last helmet head sculpture in 1983, less than three years before his death. And those are the kind, that's the kind of power that these ideas had for him, and the kind of influence they had on many other um, uh, parts, of his, parts of his work, and these are all well known. Uh, I'm not saying nobody's ever talked about these before, but they've never been considered as a group. Nobody has ever drilled down into this as a theme. Moore, over time, has suffered from greatest hits syndrome, 
And there are endless more exhibitions which have a mother and child and a figure in the shelter and a reclining figure and a wounded warrior and whatever. Um, but it's, you know, it's the, it's the stereotypical Moor rather than the real Moor who is working intensively at particular moments on specific things. Um, so we look at them all as, as a group. Um, and I think also one of the reasons these have never been looked you know, really understood is because the sources of inspiration have never been identified. Moore was very clear that he came to the Wallace to study armor, but nobody ever pursued that. Um, and when you do, it, it's very easy to identify what kinds of things at the Wallace he was interested in looking at. Not only identifying the objects that clearly attracted his attention and his interest, but when you look at what he's doing in the work, in, when he's abstracting these forms uh, and extracting certain aspects of them for his own purposes, you learn a lot about his process and, and his interests. And the fact, for example, that when he looks at an open-faced helmet like one of these Renaissance Italian ones, Venetian actually, um, uh, he uh, He's just as interested in the negative space of the face opening and the sculpting of the air in and around the material. And he always, he's always famous as the sculptor who cut holes in things. But what he's doing is sculpting negative space. And he talks you know, a lot about that, and we've, we've picked that up. But in exploring what he's doing, we learn more about seeing. We learn more about the original Renaissance art form that is not accessible to most of us normally because of our preconceptions, because of our problematic relationship or lack of it between the functional and the artistic expressive. Um, and Moore cuts right through that, but once you, once you get what he's doing, and then you start looking more widely, you know, one of the things Moore, I'm, I'm amazed actually that Moore was able to just implicitly see what's really going on here. He cuts right to the deeper level. He's not put off by surface appearances or by stereotypical misconception. Um, and once you see that he understands, for example, that each helmet, even when they are members of the same typology at the same period, they are all distinct individuals. You change something subtle about the form, something subtle about the face opening, something subtle about the areas where you expect a face to be, and you change the individual. And, you know, we're familiar with this idea that, that facial sculpture, helmets, masks, etc., can express identity in profoundly specific and individual ways. You know, all right, how many of you recognize these? How, how many of these can you identify? I, get, I, I hope some of you will recognize some of them at least. But why are you able to recognize? These are all just masks. They're all just helmets. What's special about them? Why are you able to assign identity to these when they are detached from their context? Um, this is what Moore's dealing with. And, you know, there's a whole lot more. Um, this is, this is, a, this is in, an intrinsic part of the... The, the, the whole story of, of the human impulse to create art. Um, and, you know, there, of course, there are more, more, there's all kinds of contrasts in the show, contrasts of scale, texture, material. There are very big moors that can't be in the show, but the, even his most monumental sculptures, sculptures that are four, five, eight meters high, are still related to his work on, on helmets. Um, finally, just uh, there was uh, there is one complete armor in the show. The Wallace has 43 complete armors in the collection. Moore was only ever interested in this one. He never paid any attention, as far as I can tell, to any of the others. And this is fascinating and revealing because this one, of all of them in the Wallace, is the only one that's undecorated. It's the only one that is purely sculptural in a really strong way, where the, the sculptural forms are as powerful as an abstract, uh, purposeful abstract form. And I think Moore actually saw that, an, that the armor who made this was moving towards abstract expressive forms. 
but he was constrained by the fact that he still had to fit a human being inside his sculpture. So there's a, the function exerts a limit on what the expressive artist can create. And Moore frees himself from that. He doesn't have to fit people in his sculptures. He can, he can pick up where the Renaissance sculptors left off and keep going. And that's what he does with this, with this uh, armor. He creates first a plasticine sculpture, which would uh, uh, entitled Helmet Head and Shoulders, which is derived from this armor. It's then used to create a bronze cast series. This, the one in our exhibition is from Kindly Lent from the Tate. Um, and uh, it all, interestingly, it, it's, uh, you can see that it reflects the, the, the essential sculptural character of the armor. Um, the proportions, the form, the narrow neck, the rounded skull, the asymmetry derived from functional uh, necessity of fighting on horseback. He's, he's got all of that. And interestingly for Moore, this is a powerful expression of the, the feminine protective force. He views this as inherently female and is closely related to his interest in the mother and child. The mother is the ultimate protective force. We have all benefited from that. We would, none of us would be here without it, right? Um, and, it, and that asymmetry is at once enfolding and protective. It's a shield and, um, and an enfolding arm at the same time. And if you don't, and if you don't believe me, um, there's a drawing that more from a sketchbook that, that he created in the Wiles Collection Gallery, almost certainly in front of this armor. And he's written, he's written cues to his own memory for later reference. He wants to make sure he can remember where, where he was going with this in the museum. Armor heads, female armor, woman in armor, Wallace collection. It's all there. And of course, of all the things that we have discovered in private collections and sourced after decades out of the public eye, this is the one drawing that we still cannot find. Um, we turned over every stone, we talked to every dealer, every gallery, every collector. Nobody knows where this is. So if you do, please, please let me know. So where, where have you got the reproduction? Is it from a book? Um, well, it, it's, it's published in the catalog Raisonne. Right. Henry Moore Foundation has photography of it, I but see. it was last seen in 1986. Right. Um, and it is on the reverse of a more highly worked drawing. Uh, that is, and, and it, it's undoubted, doubtable now that it is framed on the other side. And if it's changed hands a couple of times, it's conceivable that the person who has this doesn't even know that they have it. So I keep banging on about it in the hope that we'll, that we'll catch them. Um, so, you know, there it is, just there's the, the Wallace Collection um, inscription in his own hand. Um, so what's on the other side of it? Do you know that? Yeah, it's, it's three narrow standing figures. Um, we have photography of that, and we've, we've disseminated that everywhere, you know, saying if you know where this is, or if you know where this is. Um, and I got pretty close. I found one two blocks away from the Wallace Collection that's another drawing almost identical. And I thought, is it possible that it's in the ha hands of a collector two blocks away from Manchester Square? But it's not. It's unfortunately a very similar one, and somebody who's, you know, playing games with me. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's the, the, the show in a nutshell and some of the key pieces, but this is also a, a subject that, that brings up a lot of, uh, of other subject matter. It raises a lot of questions about how we look at art and what we define as art and what stops us from seeing things more deeply and, and more clearly. And we can follow someone like Moore as a guide, I think, because he, he saw very clearly indeed. I think, thank you, Toby. I think um, that was one of the first things I wanted to ask you about because if you haven't already seen it, do uh, look on our, on our website. In, we have a little Vimeo page and there's a, a short film of, well, there are two short films of featuring Toby talking about his work um, at the Wallace Collection and his passion for arms and armour. And he talks, you talk a lot about this, the idea that, that armor is, a, is an, very expressive, that we should see it as an art form, that, we, yeah. you know, that it's not just a functional thing. And if you go back to the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Mm -hmm. So I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about that. And I know in the, in the exhibition there's a big thing which says, 
um, sculpts uh, armor. You have to see armor as hollow sculpture, basically. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's not something that is a, a personal fixation of mine. I mean, my personal fixation is trying to see things from the point of view of the people who are there. That's what's important. Whatever modern interpretations we decide to make of it, for me, is kind of irrelevant. You know, I want to know what's in Michelangelo's head when he's painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and I want to know what's in the Pope Julius II's head for why he's paying so much money for it. Still not probably as much money as he spent on his armor, but that's another story. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's not an opinion, it's a fact that this was an expressive art form and it was it was considered as such. Um, you look at how armor, the great armors themselves self-identified, who they married, intermarried with, who they worked with, who they were relating with. It was inevitably painters and draftsmen and designers and sculptors. Um, they had personal relationships with the same great patrons uh, that Michelangelo and Botticelli and Dura all worked with, the same individual people. Uh, and in some cases, those artists were collaborating with, ar with armorers. Um, Dura, Dura himself uh, designed armor and decorations for armor, and he lived right across the street from the master armorers in Nuremberg. Uh, armorers were members of a wider artistic community. They were artists first and engineers second. The, the, you know, the good ones, the ones making high quality things. Um, and, uh, and you only need to look at the expense of it. If you want nothing more, no more evidence than the numbers, you look at what the stuff cost and how much of the expense has to do with the functional equipment, the stuff that will stop arrows and swords and gunshots, etc. How much of the money is spent on function and how much of the money is spent on other concerns like high polish? A high polish is fabulously expensive. It has absolutely nothing to do with function and everything to do with looking amazing mm -hmm. and looking like you are the wielder of divine power granted to you by God. It's, you know, armor becomes a proof, a, a living material proof of everything that this society is about. And when they spend the equivalent of 60,000 pounds on a decent armor, 10,000 is on the functional, and everything else is about grinding and polishing and decoration. I mean, you think of all those portraits that, of the Spanish Habsburg kings, you yeah. know, endless portraits wearing those fabulous suits yeah. of armor. Um, and they, they, you can see a lot of those suits of armor, can't you, in Madrid now? Well, I think yeah. on the subject of armored portraits, yeah. that's a really important point to pink, pick up. And very similar to the Moore show, it's about the interaction of other more well-known artists with armor and with the work of armorers. Titian is the, is the next great example to go to. But armor is a vi visual language, and it's very complex, and it can be used to say a lot of different, very specific things. And you know, modern art history is littered with misinterpretation of armored portraits because that aspect of them is not well understood. And armor is not well understood as art. It's not even recognized as art. You might ask, if I may anticipate the question, Okay, if this was so important to Henry Moore, why have we never heard about it? Why has nobody ever gone to the Wallace and already identified his, his source material if it's so obvious? Why did we have to wait 20 years uh, you know, for Toby to get around to doing it? It's because, generally, even very good art historians, a lot of the time, when they look, if they even get as far as looking at armor, they immediately hit the brick wall of functionality. They see things that are inherently self-evidently functional. It's for fighting. You wear it. I wonder how heavy it is. I wonder how you could move in it. How could you get on a horse in it? How could you go to the toilet in it? If you fell over, how could you get back up? How do you put it on? How do you take it off? Etc. 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 And yet we're so interested in self-fashioning, you know, and how 
people in the Renaissance and early modern periods, you know, presented themselves, tried to alter people's perception of them and all that. So yeah. I think it's a trick that we're missing as art historians, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, and if, if you are, you're in good company. I mean, pe most people agree that Panofsky was a good art historian, but he's really misses the mark yes. <laughs> when it comes yeah. to Titian's equestrian portrait of the Emperor Charles V at the Battle of Mulberg. He completely, he completely misses the point because he doesn't understand the arms and armor iconography, which is absolutely fundamental to the whole thing. T tell them the story, because I think this is a wonderful story. I've gone on a rant now, haven't I? What? I'm back to no, that. no, no. J I just, used just, the last Kornagi film to go on a rant about this, and now just, I'm back just, on it again. Just a quick, just quick on this, because it's yeah. really interesting what mm -hmm. the actual armor in Titian's portrait of Charles V actually signifies, because I had no idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you come to something where the arms and armor imagery is very prominent, and that Titian picture is just one of a great many examples littering medieval Renaissance art and, you know, and much more. Um, if you come without much awareness of arms and armor, um, you look at that picture and you see armor, spear. And you think to yourself, what do I understand about armor and spears? Not a whole lot in Panofsky's case. Um, he sees armor, he thinks knight. He thinks chivalry. He thinks anachronism, heroic anachronism. He sees a spear. He thinks St. George has a spear. This must have something to do with casting Charles V as St. George. He sees a horse. What does he know about horses? Well, Marcus Aurelius has a horse, and Charles V is the Holy Roman Emperor, so maybe He's casting himself as Marcus Aurelius. And this is vaguely comparable to other images of men on horses. You know, this is, but it's very wooly. Um, when actually, if you know a little bit more about arms and armor and about that period and about what was going on and, and you know, why Charles V won at the Battle of Mulberg and why this is an important victory for him, you look at that picture, I look at that picture and I see He's not dressed as a knight. He's not in full armor. I mean, that catalog has been pictured as, has been cataloged as Charles V in full armor. He's not wearing full armor. He's not got anything on his legs. He's just got boots on his legs. He doesn't have full armor on his arms. You know, we need to know what full armor is and how to define it. That's not it. He is, in fact, armed as a light cavalryman in the very latest um, uh, military scientific uh, mode of the time. You know, in the 16th century, um, standing armies and military science was evolving very rapidly. Tactics, force diversifications, gunpowder weaponry of lots of different kinds, and traditional forces like armored cavalry had to adapt. They had to change in, a, in this environment. And, you know, if lots of people are shooting at you with gunpowder weapons, you need to move faster. You need to carry less armor, ride smaller, lighter horses, and just get in and get out fast. That's really the only answer. And Charles V won at the Battle of Mulberg because he got that. And he had 2,000 uh, well-trained light cavalrymen. And he was able to execute a very rapid pincer movement and destroy his, his Lutheran enemies. The light cavalry was the key to the whole thing, and Mulberg was his greatest ever victory. But doesn't that cast um, it in a completely different light, you know, one's understanding of it? Well, it is an intensely contemporary statement of the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's got nothing to do with anachronism or anything else. I mean, if you get the side effect of looking like, you know, St. George or whatever, you know, I'm sure he'll take it, but that's not what he set out to do. And there are eyewitness accounts of how Charles V himself was armed, what he was wearing, and that is it. The armor that he wore on the day survives. It's in the, it's in the Real Armoria in Madrid, a short walk away from the Prado. In the Prado. Um, you know, so you need to get back into the world that these people were living in and understand their, their perspective. And, and, and Moore is an unusual individual because he just kind of inherently can do that. He inherently gets 
the, the, the deeper level. And most of us have to work a lot harder to get there. So should we come back to some of the themes? Because I think there are a lot of really interesting themes that come out of more sculptures. And you've, you've mentioned some of them. I mean, obviously, there's this external, internal duality. There's lots of, lots of dualities, aren't there? Um, kind of vulnerability protection. Now, you mentioned the maternal thing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the outside shell and the inside. I mean, I yeah. noticed, I went around, I was looking at it again today, and I was looking at those, the final, those little shapes that mm -hmm. he starts to produce that go inside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, that was a, a fun bit of, of, of the work conceptually uh, is that he works in Mac, when he starts moving from drawings to 3D work, he creates it first as small maquettes. This, this helmet, this lead helmet form is sort of that big. And then he creates multiple of what he called his biomorphs. Um, and he tries different internal sculptures with the same external sculpture to explore the relationship and see what, how they interact, because this is two sculptures interacting, the internal and the external. Initially, the, the internal sculpture is organic, it's lithe, it looks fleshy, uh, it looks vulnerable. It, it, you know, it, it expresses that basic naked human vulnerability that we're all deeply sensitive about and have been for a long time. Um, and then the exterior form has a sort of artificiality, a strength, a structure to it. It's hard, it's inflexible, it's protective. Um, and then it's the interplay between that outer protective force and the internal. But then, of course, more, he was always very clear on the fact that he didn't want to be too specific about his work. He wanted to create work that you would then interact with and make of it what you would for your own reasons. So, you know, there's no end of psychoanalysis of this work, and Moore, Moore is very dismissive of it. He sort of said, well, you, you, of course you can psychoanalyze it if you want to, but it has nothing to do with me. Um, and he never talked about his, you know, war experience, for example, which looms very large in this work, but he never said a word about it. Um, uh, so. You can see this as the skull and the brain, or the intellect and the body, or the or the outer the 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 outer presentation to the world versus the inner life, or the you know the body and the soul. And this is all there, um, but it's sort of up to you to you know work out what what the mixture is. Um, and and over time, the helmet heads evolve in a, in a very kind of organic way. Um, and in, in the helmet heads in the 1960s, you start to see an inversion where the outer form starts to become fleshy and organic and the internal form starts to become more engineered and artificial. Um, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's like most good ideas, you can go quite a long way with it. I mean, I think it's one of the things that rather fascinated Kenneth Clark, isn't it? Because yeah. I don't know if, 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 if all of you know, but Kenneth Clark was really very, very a big fan of, uh, of Henry Moore and he described him as the, apparently as the best artist of his generation mm -hmm. and really promoted his career. Um, and you know, I was reading about it and he, he was instrumental in getting the first, uh, is it the first recumbent figure mm -hmm. into the Tate mm -hmm. before Moore became a big, you know, a big star across the when Atlantic When the director of the Tate said that Henry Moore will enter the Tate under over my dead body. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so, but, and, and, and one of the things that Clark, as I understand it, was very interested in was he saw him as a sort of neo-romantic going back to the tradition of um, Samuel Palmer, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and Blake, you know, and so, it, it, and, and I think he sometimes described, described his work as spooky, didn't he? He was interested mm -hmm. in this inner, yeah. this inner kind of notion of what was going on. But a lot of people say that. I mean, the show's been open long enough where we can start to get, we can, you know, collect comment cards and at the Wallace, for whatever reason, people are very enthusiastic fillers out of comment cards. <laughs> Uh, and some of them are treatises in themselves. Um, the, the front of house staff usually only show me the positive ones. I have to search for the negative ones. But there was one about uh, uh, 
a curator giving a tour and speaking too loudly. I don't know who that was. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of people say that they find them unsettling, um, creepy, uh, or cer certain of them. It's usually the one that seems to have staring eyes, and that's a primal, a pretty you know, primal response. You know, you as a, a former prey species don't like being stared at, and you know, we still don't sometimes. Um, others find them humorous. I mean, people giggle in the galleries, and why not? Um, they're playful. Um, you know, each of us is trying to work them out, and we, we try several approaches to, to them, almost kind of unknowingly. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, always very interested to hear what people make of them. I mean, I've sort of spent enough time with them now that I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm not sure I, I, uh, I can still see them as I did when I first saw them, but. Um. But it's also interesting that, that Clark was, was, was so keen on him and this, this mm -hmm. idea that, that, that they expressed some, some kind of Britishness because Kenneth Clark was very interested in kind of promoting a kind of new British art, revival of British art, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Mm -hmm. And so I was yeah. thinking about, you know, go, does it go back to some medieval notion of, of you know, chivalry and knighthood and I don't know. I mean, where do you see that all coming? The, the, the the Britishness or Englishness of mm, them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Maybe, yeah. and, and it's sort of, I've worked a lot on Englishness, specifically in armor. Um, I mean, we know that there were master armorers working in London um, since the early 14th century. And they had a royal charter from King Henry VI by the middle of the 15th century. So they were clearly making the best gear. Um, but, no ar but no late medieval English armor survives. Um, and so it's been ignored generally in the scholarship. And I, I started on it with my PhD, and then I did a PhD on English style and design as far as we can um, understand it from other sources. Um, and then I just kept working on it for another 15 years. I'm still trying to finish publishing it. Half of it's published, but the other half is coming out sometime. But in looking at armor and starting as a very specific interest, wanting to fill a hole in the scholarship that is more difficult to study because we don't have any examples. We have to look at sculptural representations, pictorial, we have to look at documents and all sorts of other things to build up a picture of what they were probably making. All of that technical stuff um, just kind of naturally led me to start asking questions about Englishness. How did the English define themselves? When did they start conceiving of themselves as somehow distinctive and different than their French or, or German relatives. Um, you know, and it's a much bigger question than I'm really qualified to fully answer, but I do continual, continually encounter the historical English identity in my work. You encounter it in the 16th century as well. And to try and approach it, this from that angle, the English, you know, there's, a, there's sort of an island mentality, and I guess I can look at it, from, I'm not English, so I can look at it from a certain remove, but the, the island aspect of it, it leads to an assumption of difference and distinctiveness and superiority, the, a chosen people. I mean, everybody thinks they're the chosen people, right? That's not, but, but these are, th this is kind of what defines the historical Englishness as a concept. Um, the English regard themselves as, as better than everyone else. And if you really believe that, you can build an empire, clearly. If you believe it, everyone else might believe it too. Um, and interestingly, I, in my own work in the 15th century, I also looked at what the foreign attitude to the English was. How did, that's really in some ways more interesting. What did foreigners think of the English? How did they distinguish them as, as different or unusual? And the, the French and um, Flemish and Italian sources 
um, typically regard the medi late medieval English as um, physically bigger, scarier, more violent, desperately proud of themselves, given to making speeches to each other. <laughs> um, uh, if they're not fighting foreigners, they're happy to fight themselves. Um, you know, and, uh, but there's this kind of roughy tuftiness about, about the English. And that, that we are, we are muscular and we are tough and we will take your country if we feel like it, even though we're small and in a, cor in a corner, you know. And um, that, that, really, that really bleeds over into the art. I mean, in the 16th century, uh, with when the, the art of the rapier and civilian swords really develops, which is a subject of another exhibition of mine in 2012, you start to see very characteristically Germanic, French, Spanish, Italian, and English rapiers. So the, the rapier is a very personal object. It's a simulacrum of the wearer, it's expressive of identity, um, and everybody's wearing them and everybody's checking everybody else's to get whatever information they can expressively out of them. And English rapiers are chunky, They're, they look more like military swords than other rapiers do. They have big round club-like pommels and big round beefy terminals on the bars and the blades tend to be a bit wider than, than continental rapiers, and there's just a, you know, it's this sort of burliness. Um, and it's a way of expressing this, this identity. Um, and more, I mean, some of that does come across in Moore as well. And, you know, Moore did fight in the First World War. He killed people. He was a machine gunner at Cambrai. How would you, how would you not? He was an armor user at a time when when armor had been, steel armor had been in, reintroduced for the first time in several hundred years. Um, so he has that practical experience the, the, of the user as well, and that he understands perfectly well the, the expression of identity. Um, and they are, they are strong, muscular things. I mean, Moore was very practical. Whenever he made a sculpture, he was immediately thinking of the technical specifications. Okay, I want to build this giant thing, but where is the weight going? How is it supported? You know, he had, his daughter told me he had an amazing perception of weight and dimensions. He could look at somebody across a room, tell you precisely to the centimeter how tall they were, and precisely almost to the gram how much they weighed. He just had that, he had that feel for things. Um, so I think, I think the, mu the muscularity of it might be one thing that Kenneth Clark is somehow intuiting. And he did describe how he felt like the form of, uh, the internal form of helmet head number one, um, Clark said, it's like, a, it's like a spearhead thrust right through the skull. And, you know, that's something a medieval Englishman would appreciate, you know. Um, or an arrowhead, you might say. And yet, um, you know, when you say that, that, that obviously Moore had this experience of war, he also really reacted against it, because in his life he, he was very much identified with a number of, mm -hmm. of anti-war mm -hmm. campaigns, wasn't mm -hmm. he? I mean, he... Yeah, that's he, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting because in his own war experience, he felt it was a, he felt it was a just cause, uh, it was the right thing to do, he went and did it, and he was poisoned with mustard gas to the point when he had to be invalided back to England. As soon as he could get out of the hospital, he signs up as an army bayonet fighting instructor, and then he's back on the front line as soon as he can get there. And luckily for the history of art, he was only able to get there in 1918, days before peace was declared. Um, but if he'd been behind by six months or a year, he you know, could easily have been killed and we wouldn't have anything to talk about. Um, uh, so he, on the one hand, has a kind of just war mentality. And he's, it's, he's not obviously disturbed by it, at least in the short term. Um, but then the rest of his life is, is profoundly anti-war. 
um, and he creates work to support, um, you know, uh, Republican Spanish prisoners in French internment camps during the, the Civil War. He's a war artist in the Second World War. He creates work, you know, uh, you know, c campaigning against nuclear armament and. You know, the, the Helmet Head series itself seems to spring up at periods of military and, and geopolitical tension. Um, so that, I mean, that's an interesting quality. I mean, I, it's a shame in a way he never talked about it. And we just sort of have to infer a lot about it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's a you know, profound pacifist and an anti-war activist. But never made, you know, he's, he's from Yorkshire, you know, he never made a big deal out of it. He never, you know, he never grandstanded about it. It was just a very, a very plain, practical um, stand. Well, he had another one of the kind of dichotomies or kind of mm -hmm. strange mm -hmm. off mirror things yeah. in, his, in his... But, the, but the, his sculpt, interestingly, just on that moment, um, uh, his... his huge four four and a half meter tall nuclear energy monument um, uh, is normally this is an unusual um, view of it this is you know the side you never see in the books I've shown you this side because that's the helmet where, where side. is this one this is in at the University of Chicago right this was commissioned in the 1960s as a a commemoration of the first controlled nuclear reaction achieved by Enrico Fermi and the 1940s. Um, the side, the other side of this is the side you do see in all the books because it's the side with the skull's um, eye sockets and it much more strongly looks like a skull sitting on top of a, of a mushroom cloud um, and, or you can read it as that. Um, so after and, and interestingly the a, a, a literal collage of an actual photograph of a mushroom cloud with a skull, um, you know, collaged onto it was one of the, the famous posters for the um, for the nuclear disarmament mov movement in this country in the 1960s. So it could have been an inspiration for him in one way or another. But the fact is, he was aware of that of that movement and that imagery of all those posters and and, and graphic art. Great. Well, I think, Toby, you're probably longing for a glass of wine, <laughs> so uh, you've worked hard. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for um, mm -hmm. talking to us tonight. Mm -hmm. And before, um, before I give Toby a hand, I just want to say to all of you that we have another one of these talks coming up um, in a few weeks' time on the 9th of May. We've got um, the curators, uh, two of the curators of the Renaissance Nude coming to talk. Um, Jill Burke, who's a professor at Edinburgh, art historian, um, and Per Rumberg, who is a curator at the Royal Academy, and they're coming to talk about that, that exhibition. So do uh, look on the website, get your tickets from Eventbrite, and uh, we hope to see you then. But thank you, Toby, so much for a great talk and for a great exhibition. Mm, thank you. Thank you.